Hi, welcome to uh, week four of PolySci 506, Bayesian Nonparametric and Computational Statistics. I'm Dr. Justin Estery. And uh, this week we're going to start uh, really getting our uh, feet wet with um, using the uh, existing packages that are out there to help you with <coughs> Bayesian uh, modeling um, without having to program all your own um, Gibbs samplers and Metropolis Hastings algorithm, algorithms and the like. Um, so what we're going to do this week is first I'm going to show you uh, what packages are out there, how to get them set up on your computer and, and all that. And then we're going to do some uh, applied analysis um, with these packages. And you'll see that um, even though it's a lot easier than uh, having to do every single bit of the work yourself, programming your own custom Gibbs sampler and, and the like, um, they're not foolproof packages and you still have to have a good understanding of what's going on under the hood in order to uh, ensure that this al the algorithms that you use uh, are working correctly. And so the things that we learned last week will carry over into uh, this week in the sense that it'll help you um, um, get a, have a better sense of what these packages are doing and, and make sure that uh, what they're doing is what you would like them to be doing. Uh, with that, let's uh, go ahead and get started. So uh, the first thing you need to do in order to get started with uh, using um, prepackaged Gibbs samplers is to, to get one. And there are two that I'm going to focus on today. Uh, one is uh, WinBugs, which I've got its page pulled up here. Uh, and the other is OpenBugs, which is a, a fork of the WinBugs project. Um, that's uh, basically, uh, <laughs> I'm actually, it's the same or very similar people working on the two. I think the original WinBugs might have been meant to be proprietary or something. I don't know. But they have roots in, uh, in uh, some, some of the same people and some of the same techniques. Um, bugs uh, and, and uh, open bugs and wind bugs are um, Gibbs samplers that are pre-programmed um, uh, for, uh, for your computer and allow you to take advantage of um, not having to worry about making sure that all the computational bits are, are working uh, correctly. Um, so uh, it makes it a lot easier to build a very complex model um, and uh, to rest assured that the Gibbs sampler that you use to attack that complica complex model is itself um, working well. So uh, in order to install WinBugs on your computer, it's, it's pretty easy. If you have a 32-bit machine, you can literally just download WinBugs14.exe, install it, and, and that's it. Uh, it. It does it all for you. Um, uh, if you have a 64-bit machine, though, and most uh, modern computers are 64-bit now, uh, it's a little more complicated. You have to download and install um, the WinBugs 14 program that's already been compiled for you right here. Uh, and then you have to um, open it up and got a whole bunch of stuff down here. Um, you've got to unzip it. It takes just a second to do. Uh, then once it's unzipped, you actually have to copy this and paste it into your program files, which is where R expects it to be when we when we use that and uh, when we call WinBugs from R, it'll expect it to be in the program files folder. So you have to just paste that into your program files folder like so. It should show up here. And one thing you want to check to make sure is that uh, you have this set for the right permissions. Otherwise, things will not uh, work quite right. So uh, you want to go over to security here and ensure that um, users have all uh, permissions. So if you, uh, just to show what I did here, just right click on this, go to properties, scroll over to security, and then scroll down to users. And we're gonna actually want, for this particular WinBugs file, um, we're going to want um, all permissions to be granted um, to uh, users in this case. So if I wanna edit this, I just click edit, and I can go down to uh, users here. And I just want to give uh, full control to users. Um, apply that. And now users have full control over the WinBugs folder. Uh, like I said, this is going to be necessary because otherwise R won't be able to access WinBugs or uh, permissions errors will come up when you try to access WinBugs uh, through R. So uh, now uh, WinBugs is set up. If you double click on that program files folder, you'll see down here WinBugs14.exe. There's actually one more thing to do, or two more things really, to do before uh, we're finally ready to use WinBugs. Um, the first is to uh, download this patch um, for 1.4.3. 
Um, you don't necessarily have to do that, but you certainly can. Um, all you do is just, uh, this is a big text file um, full of what appears to be gibberish, uh, but WinBugs knows how to interpret it. All you have to do is uh, save this source as a text file, maybe save it to your desktop, like so. Uh, and then open WinBugs. So here's my WinBugs folder. And I don't want to have it ask every time, so I just don't click there. I tell I don't want to ask for permission every time. Uh, open the text file on my desktop. So it doesn't appear at first, but if I go to text, you'll see it pops up. Uh, and then I want to go to, uh, or I'm sorry, it's tools and decode. And then just say decode all. And it'll ask me for some permissions, that's fine. Um, and once it's done, you can just quit. Like so. Uh, and when you open it again, I think it tells you that a patch has been applied. Uh, I can go over here and, yeah, it should be 1.4.3, which is exactly what we wanted. Uh, now, the second thing you have to do uh, with WinBugs is you have to install a license file. Um, so it doesn't cost any money, um, but for whatever reason, the creators of the program wanted you to have to install a license key separately. So um, you just download this immortalitykey.txt to your desktop, just like I did before, with the patch. Uh, open up uh, WinBugs. Open up the text file with the license in it, right there. And then tell it to decode. And you should get this keys.ocf, just tell it to decode all. And that's it. And as long as you close WinBugs and open it up again, everything should work fine from that point on. So, uh, so that's how you get WinBugs working, pretty simple. Unfortunately, uh, as the name would suggest, WinBugs is only available on Windows, um, including Windows 7, Windows Vista, um, Windows uh, XP, I think it, it also works on, at least I seem to remember using WinBugs on XP. Um, so if you're using a Mac or a Linux machine, um, you have a couple of options available to you. One is to try to use Wine, uh, which is a recursive algorithm for Wine is not an emulator, uh, and, and, and in effect to um, emulate Windows inside of Mac. Uh, the other thing you can do uh, is to install Parallels or some other um, uh, virtual machine program. I think there's another one called VMware. Um, and run Windows inside of your Mac or Linux box. So this unfortunately requires you to install Windows um, on your machine uh, in addition to your Mac or Linux OS, uh, but you'll be able to use WinBugs. Uh, OpenBugs is a lot easier to install. You just go to the downloads file. Uh, there is a, where is it? Uh, here we go. You can see there, uh, OpenBugs is available for Linux and for Windows. Uh, with Max, you're still out of luck. It tells you to use uh, Wine, I believe. Um, so in that case, uh, probably installing Parallels is your best bet. Uh, but if you go to um, Open Bugs here, it'll download a 12 megabyte folder that's a setup file that all you have to do is double click and it does the rest. Uh, so if I just, and it's scanning it or something. If I go to Open Bugs and run that, accept the licensing agreements, just take all the default options, and once it's done, you're good to go. You're ready to go with OpenBugs. Uh, WinBugs and OpenBugs, like I said, uh, share some common roots, and, and for many practical purposes are identical. And you can call um, R, I'm sorry, you can call either WinBugs or OpenBugs uh, from R directly. Uh, in order to do that, you're going to have to install um, some additional packages in R. So let's uh, switch over to R and, and talk about which packages you need to install. So uh, here I am in R. This is my lecture file for this week. And you can see there are two libraries uh, that I'm loading in order to uh, execute the commands for this week. Uh, one is called ARM and one is called BRUGS. Um, ARM is uh, a very excellent package provided by um, Jennifer Hill and Andrew Gelman that accompanies their uh, really great multi-level modeling book, um, which is one of the um, assigned books for this class. I've used it in the past as well for my linear model class. It's a great book, and it comes with some software that's very helpful. Uh, BRUGS is uh, a, a package full of commands for um, calling 
um, bugs, open bugs, and win bugs through R. There's a subsidiary package called R2 win bugs that I can't remember if it's the ARM or BRUX package also loads. So you're just going to want to install these two packages if you haven't already. And I believe, yes, I've already got them uh, installed. Um, BRUGS is going to allow us to um, run um, my GIB sampler models um, through WinBugs or OpenBugs uh, directly without doing any, uh, 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 all, all through R. Um, WinBugs and OpenBugs can actually run on their own as standalone programs, and you saw that uh, before. When I opened WinBugs, a program came open, sort of looks like a program, it works like a program. Um, but since we're working in R, um, and all our data sets are coming through R, for example, it, it might be more convenient for you to, um, to work through R, and that's, that's how I'm going to show you how to do it. All right, so uh, we've got our packages loaded. Now let's uh, start some analysis. So what I'm going to do is start off with a, uh, a Bayesian regression. And what I've done here is created a, a fake regression data set of size 50. Uh, the data generating process is 3 plus 2x plus a normal error. Uh, the normal error has mean 0 and standard deviation of 2. And I've created a data frame called dat that has y and x in it. Uh, and uh, what I want to do is I want to run a regression model. Um, I want to run a regression model using either WinBugs or OpenBugs. And uh, what this regression model is going to do is it's going to um, sample out of the posterior of a uh, regression uh, model with the standard regression likelihood, which you probably learned in one of your maximum likelihood classes, or you could have seen it last week when we talked about it, uh, and some prior that we've specified. Uh, now, there are a bunch of different ways uh, I, can, I can do this. Um, oops. Uh, so what I want to do is uh, I'm going to um, specify my model in what's called a, a, a bugs file, a, 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 a .bug file. Uh, the bugs file has um, the actual model that I'm going to run in it. So let's open up a, a .bug file and, and for, that corresponds to this regression and, and take a look at what components it contains. All right, so here I've got example1.bug. This is a regression uh, model. And uh, bugs files have their own uh, special syntax, which uh, you have to learn if you'd like to use um, uh, WinBugs or OpenBugs to um, as your as your Gibbs sampler. Now, there's another a third option, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, called MCMC Pack, which also implements some some uh, Gibbs samplers and Metropolis Hastings samplers that you can also use if you like. Um, but if you want to use uh, WinBugs or OpenBugs, you have to learn the, the bugs um, language. And uh, it's, it's not, fortunately, that hard to learn. Uh, and there is some excellent uh, documentation associated with this. So um, if you go to the WinBugs page, uh, you'll see if I click on WinBugs here. Um, whoops. Did not work. Uh-oh. Oh, awesome. <laughs> well, since the WinBugs website doesn't seem to be working at exactly this moment, oh, let's look at the OpenBugs uh, documentation, which, as I said, is very similar to the WinBugs documentation. So there's some nice manuals here that can get you started on, on how to, um, to run bugs. Um, but most importantly, from my perspective, is they have uh, examples of large library of example models that you can look at uh, to see what they've done and how they've done it. Um, secondly, they have a, a nice, uh, uh, in their manual, they have appendices. Uh, let's see if I can go here. Uh, ba -ba -ba user manual. Contents. Aha. And there's an appendix. Uh, da -da 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 -da, tutorial. Nope. Ah, here we go. In the uh, model specification link right here, they've got a nice uh, appendix where all the different distributions that you can um, uh, use to sample from uh, and a bunch of different functions, mathematical functions that um, WinBugs and OpenBugs knows uh, are all stored in here. So uh, the online manual and the online examples are a really good place um, to, to figure out uh, what you're doing and, and to um, model your particular um, 
to to model your uh, models uh, on the uh, to model your models. That's great. Uh, to to in other in other words, to take a look at things that they've done and uh, literally uh, copy and adapt what they've done to things that you would like to do. Um, it, it works uh, really well, and it's a, it's a good way to get going quickly um, with learning uh, how this uh, how it works. Uh, so uh, what I want to do is uh, show you my regression file, and as we're going through it, talk a little bit about how these bugs files are generally structured, um, and uh, the kind of things you can do when you start to, to build your model. So uh, here's my uh, example one dot bug. Every bug file uh, is um, begun and ended with a model statement. So there's model and then a bracket and then an end bracket. This tells bugs that this is the model I'd like to update. This is the model I'm trying to run. Um, and uh, what you do is you sort of treat uh, this model as a, a bit of code that tells the uh, Gibbs sampler in open bugs or win bugs uh, what to do. So in this case, uh, I've got a data set where the dependent variable is called y, and the length of that data set is called n, um, and it needs to be told those things, which it will be uh, by r. Um, and for every observation in 1 to n uh, for the data set, um, I want the dependent variable to be distributed, where the distribution is this little t tilde thing, uh, normal, according to the normal density, d norm, just like an r, uh, with a mean uh, parameter y and a precision parameter tau y. Now, you'll notice I said precision and not standard deviation. It turns out that uh, the precision is 1 over the standard deviation, which open bugs and win bugs use as a convention for reasons I don't fully understand. Um, but just remember that tau is going to be um, 1 over sigma um, when, you, when you specify what tau is supposed to be. Um, Actually, I take that back. Tau is 1 over sigma squared, which you can see in the model specification uh, uh, um, manual here in the appendix for distributions. You can see that the normal is actually a function of tau is appearing in places where sigma squared would ordinarily appear, 1 over sigma squared. So uh, tau is actually 1 over sigma squared, not 1 over sigma. Uh, anyway, so um, I've got a standard normal distribution with uh, mean of mu dot y and uh, standard, or I'm sorry, precision of tau y. Uh, and uh, what's my mean supposed to be? Well, this is a normal, uh, uh, classical linear normal model. So uh, the mean of this distribution is going to be alpha plus beta x, where um, alpha plus beta x is the regression equation. So the regression equation tells me uh, where I expect the distribution to appear. The normal density part of it tells me that there's going to be error around that expectation. Uh, so this first bit just basically says this is how the data should look. The data should be normally distributed around a mean given by this linear regression and uh, with a variance or precision in this case of tau. Now, I don't know what alpha, beta, and tau y are. Uh, neither does wind bugs uh, or, or open bugs. Um, but I can tell it um, my prior densities for these things. So. I'm in this last bit here specifying what's my prior density for alpha, beta, and tau. So for alpha and beta, I'm specifying a, a normal density with a uh, precision of 0 0.001. Now that's 1 over sigma squared, which means I'm putting a very big standard deviation on this parameter. So this is, uh, a, 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 in, in essence, a very diffuse, although slightly informative, uh, prior density. Uh, for tau y, I'm, I'm giving it the, uh, the gamma density. Um, this is the uh, inverse of the inverse gamma density that we talked about last week, uh, which is why it's appropriate for a, a variance parameter like tau. Um, it's bounded at zero and has a, um, it goes out to infinity. Just, uh, just actually, uh, let me think about this. So uh, the, uh, the sigma squared is going to be bound at zero, which means um, one over sigma squared. Yeah, it's also going to be... Um, it's, it has to be right, infinity, right? So, because if it was less than one, that would imply sigma less than one, so right, it has to be bounded at zero. Um, so anyway, this uh, shape and scale parameter of the, of the gamma density of 0 0.001 is giving me a very diffuse prior. So I'm specifying diffuse priors uh, for, the, for the entire model. So this is a, a very, very simple um, bug file that gives me a, a linear a very simple linear regression and tells open bugs and wind bugs 
um, how to uh, what the model looks like, and it's going to figure out more or less on its own how to update uh, the posterior given that this mo given this model I've told it. So the next question is, uh, how do I uh, get this to happen in R? Well, it's a relatively uh, simple procedure. Uh, the first thing I need to do is um, specify what da the data is. Now, in this case, the data is stored in R's memory. Um, you can see X and Y are up here, and I see I need to actually get N in there as well. Let me just run this bit here. So I've got X, Y, and N in memory. Uh, the data um, object is just a list of the names of what, N, of what data I need to feed to bugs, uh, either open bugs or win bugs. Um, so I don't actually have to feed it in, I just need to feed it the name of N, and, and BRUGS will take care of feeding the data itself. Uh, the second thing I need to do is uh, create initial values. This is the start of the Gibbs sampler chain, the initial value of the chain, for all the parameters I'm going to update. And I'm going to update alpha, beta, and tau y, and so I'm going to initialize them at 0, 0, and 1. And uh, this is the format that this needs to come in, and it needs to be a function that returns a list takes no arguments and returns a list. This, again, is just a convention of open bugs and win bugs. So just do it this way. Uh, the parameters um, is a uh, character vector of the names of the parameters for which I wish to uh, examine the posterior density. In this case, I want to look at alpha, beta, and tau y, so I create a character vector that has alpha, beta, and tau y separated by commas um, in quotation marks. The final argument is the argument that actually calls um, either win bugs or open bugs. And this is the bug statement. So if I just do a help on bugs, you can see um, how this is being called. This comes out of the R2 win bugs package, which I think is loaded by BRUGS. Um, and uh, there are a lot of options you can specify uh, in, in bugs. I've specified um, the most common. Um, so I will talk about what, what I've specified here. Um, first, you have to feed it the data, the initial values, and the parameters, and the name of the file that contain the bug file that contains your model. That's data in its parameters to save and model.file. And I suggest you set your working directory uh, to the source file location, and then drop all your bugs files in in where your R file is. In other words, just keep them all in the same folder, and, and that's sort of an easy thing to easy way to make it all work. N dot chains tells it. How many Mark, uh, how many Monte Carlo, uh, Markov, Monte, Markov chain Monte Carlo chains you want R, uh, R or in this case WinBugs and OpenBugs to run? Um, WinBugs and OpenBugs are capable of running multiple chains at the same time, and if you have say a four-core PC, it might make sense to run four chains at the same time than to run one chain that's four times as long. I actually have a twelve-core PC here. I don't think it's probably overkill to run four or twelve chains, but I can run maybe four chains. Um, n.iter is the number of iterations per chain, uh, and that's inclusive of the burn-in. So in this case, I'm going to have it update uh, 5,000 times with a burn-in of 1,000. Now I've got four chains running, so that's going to give me a total of 20,000 draws, five times four, but I'm going to lose 4,000 of those to burn-in. So I'm really going to get 16,000 draws out of this procedure. Uh, N thin is that thinning thing we talked about last week. Uh, I could discard every um, so many uh, observations a, a, as a way of making the autocorrelation between the, um, the draws uh, less. Um, I'm in fact setting N thin to 1, uh, which means no thinning at all. There's going to be no thinning at all. Uh, debug is uh, basically a way of getting a detailed output from the open bugs or win bugs program, especially if something goes wrong. In this case, I know nothing's going to go wrong, so I'm going to set debug equal to false. But you can set it equal to true if, if you need to, if something's crashing and you need to figure out what's wrong. Uh, and finally, the program, I'm going to have this update via win bugs. And I'm going to save the output of this command in regression.sim. So if I run this command, you can see uh, win bugs pops open, it updates the chains, and now it's done. So uh, now that we've got our uh, regression simulation all loaded in, what we might want to do is uh, first uh, start doing some diagnostic plots the way we normally would. 
Um, and, but in this case, it's going to be slightly more complicated because um, we've used bugs to, to draw our chain. Our, our, uh, our, we've used bugs as a Gibbs sampler to get our, um, uh, our Markov chains. And we've got four of them. We've got more than, and more than one. Um, there are some packages, however, that, that help you do this diagnostics, uh, help you do these diagnostics very easily. Uh, the MCMC plots package is one of these. Uh, and uh, the MCMC plots package has several commands that, that might be of interest, but the one we're going to talk about right now is this aptly named MCMC plot um, command. Uh, all you need to do for MCMC plot is just feed it your uh, bugs object, regression.sim in this case, uh, and also tell it to um, dump uh, the files it's going to create um, in the uh, current working directory, which you can uh, specify with the git wd uh, command. Um, and what's going to happen is it's going to dump uh, a bunch of um, PNG files and an HTML file um, into your current directory. Um, so if I open this uh, file, uh, what it's going to do, let me just minimize so you can see my face, uh, it's going to create diagnostic plots for all of the parameters that were estimated by the Markov chain. Alpha, beta, tau y, and also a, a deviance uh, parameter, which is the, uh, it's uh, related to the total likelihood. Um, so you can see right here, for example, um, each one of our chains, list, chains is listed in a different color. Uh, here's our posterior plot for each of the four chains, and they're pretty much identical. Um, and uh, you can see they're mixing pretty well over the space of the uh, possible parameters. Um, and there's uh, pretty much a perfect overlap. In other words, we're, we're not getting the case where one chain is exploring the sp uh, space really well and another one's not. Uh, the same for beta. All our chains look pretty much the same and they're pretty much mixing as we would expect. Here's our autocorrelation plot. Uh, virtually no autocorrelation. That's really, really good. Um, this is a partial autocorrelation plot, which I think controls for the other parameters in the, in the estimate, or pr parameters in the model. Um, but our autocorrelation plots all look uh, pretty, pretty good, pretty normal. Um, so what we've learned here is, uh, first of all, cool command. Uh, secondly, um, this estimation seems to have gone pretty well. Uh, open bugs seems to be, or I'm sorry, win bugs, seems to be doing pretty much what we would expect it to. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is uh, attach the regression.sim object. I'm actually going to get rid of these plots. We're going to need those. I'm going to focus on just plotting the uh, density for our alpha, beta, and tau y, our three uh, parameters. Um, and you can see here that, uh, so the true value of uh, alpha, which is the constant, is 3. Um, and you can see that our posterior density is uh, pretty well centered over 3. It's uh, shrunk towards 0, which is what we'd expect given uh, we have a... a a, um, well, anyway, um, yeah, actually, we, we don't have a prior in this. Uh, actually, no, that, I take that back. We do have a prior in this particular case. Uh, you can see it in the uh, bugs file, it's a, but it's a very diffuse prior, but it is centered on zero. Um, so we're seeing a bit of shrinkage towards zero, which is, which is what we would expect um, given, given that diffuse, but still centered on zero prior. Um, in fact, I might be even able to even uh, add a uh, vertical line at the true value so we can get a sense of how we're doing here. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, and maybe even also add a, a quantile um, a calculation of the 95% um, credible region around alpha. Uh, so if we do a quantile um, alpha uh, and do probabilities uh, 0.025 uh, and 0.975 for a 95% credible interval. Uh, we can see the 95% credible interval is uh, 1.12 to 3.86, um, which is, uh, you know, um, centered on the true value, um, albeit a little bit shifted towards zero um, and a little bit uh, diffuse, but still nothing really wrong. Uh, what about beta? That's our coefficient on x, um, which we might be most concerned with if we were actually conducting a, a live analysis. Uh, well, here's my density for beta. It's uh, the true value is supposed to be. It's supposed to be. Oh, I take that back. The true value for the constant is supposed to be three. So I should. There we go. Uh, so yeah, three is, is still in the 95% credible interval. That's good news. Uh, the true value for beta is supposed to be two. Um, so if I do a density plot of beta, 
you can see that um, it is centered on two. It's actually shifted a little bit to the right, um, which is away from the prior. Um, this is probably just due to the fact that uh, we only have a sample of size 50, so there's some degree of variation um, in the estimate. Um, but our 95% um, credible interval um, still comfortably has um, the true value of two inside of it, although again, uh, a bit diffuse. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is uh, there's a bit of, uh, this is a fairly high variance estimate, probably owing to the fact that we only have 50 observations in this particular data set. Uh, tau y is the um, is our estimate of how much error there is um, in, in the data generating process. Um, remember that tau y is 1 over sigma squared. So if we wanted to plot this um, as a variance, or a standard deviation rather, uh, we could um, take the square root of 1 over tau y and plot that instead. And it's centered on uh, 2. Um, which uh, makes sense because that's exactly how much data generating or error was in the data generating process. So we're getting correct answers there. Um, I could add an absolute variance line or absolute value line or a, <laughs> just a vertical dot or a dash line there to indicate the true value. Um, and finally, add in a 95% um, credible region. I want to do this on tau y. Tau.y. Uh, and again, um, the true value is um, well within, um, actually I should really do this on square root of 1 over tau y. Yeah, so 2 is well inside that uh, confident or the credible region. Uh, so, so far everything seems to be uh, going pretty good. Um, that's how you run a regression in, in R um, using uh, the WinBug sampler. Um, now, if I want to use the OpenBug sampler, which is very similar to the WinBug sampler, all I need to do is take that program command and sub change it out from WinBugs to OpenBugs. Uh, so I'm going to rerun uh, everything, but uh, now I'm just going to have it use OpenBugs instead of WinBugs. And you can see instead of that OpenBugs window opening up, um, I got a win, or I'm sorry, instead of that WinBugs window opening up, I got this open bug, uh, open bugs output printing out on my R uh, command. Um, and what I've used here is the print um, regression.sim command instead of the um, various other commands I used before. This print command also works for WinBugs output. I just decided this was a good opportunity to, to show you this print output. What this tells you is the mean and so, uh, standard deviation and uh, various quantiles of each of the estimated parameters, alpha, beta, tau, y, and the um, uh, deviance, which is, again, a function of the likelihood. Um, and it, it sort of tells us, okay, well, uh, our mean estimate for alpha was 2.5 um, with a standard deviation of 0.7, um, and our 95% credible region would be from 1.1 to 3.9, uh, which is pretty much the same answer we got last time, as I recall. Uh, we could um, estimate the regression diagnostics um, just like we did before using the MCMC plot package. Uh, I suspect they won't be much different um, for uh, running in open bugs uh, compared to win bugs, um, but it's worth uh, checking to make sure. So if I go in here and look at my MCMC output, ah, well in this case you can see I only uh, specified one chain, which is only one chain is showing up. Um, other than that, these things are looking pretty similar, although I'm noticing a bit of autocorrelation in the ag or in the lag uh, for beta and alpha um, more than we were in the WinBugs command, which is a bit strange, um, a little bit unusual. Um, what if happens if I specify four chains for my OpenBug command and then rerun this? So it's going to... Oh, there we go, and I should be able to run this. Yeah, again, getting relatively similar results, although I noticed that the autocorrelation is a bit higher for the uh, alpha and beta um, than it was before. I noticed actually the partial autocorrelation is better and the raw autocorrelation is worse. So this may have something to do, although <laughs> speaking out of ignorance here, may have something to do with um, the way these things, uh, open bugs and win bugs, are, are optimized, their default characteristics. Um, they may work on slightly different um, slightly different procedures. Either way, we're getting roughly the same results and, and good results. Uh, now, uh, you may have noticed that there are these diagnostic um, 
things, well, I guess maybe it's not clear their diagnostics, but the Gewicki, um, Heidelberg, and Raftery diagnostic criteria, um, these are um, specified um, in your um, a Jackman textbook as ways of checking to ensure, oh, wind bugs is in my face, uh, ways of checking to ensure uh, that your Markov chains uh, look good, um, that they are... Um, uh, meet the criteria of a good Markov chain um, estimate for your target density, in this case, a target posterior. And if you recall, um, things we want out of our chain are um, we want them to be irreducible, which is to say um, they need to completely um, uh, cover the space, uh, 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 parameter space that we're interested in estimating and not um, be boilable down to um, a, a subset of that space. Uh, we also want them to be aperiodic, to tour, uh, to have a chance of touring the entire space. Um, and really, most importantly, we want them to be an accurate reflection um, of the space. And th what that means is we want um, the Markov chain to, um, in, at, at, at uh, later points in its estimation, um, to not be different than itself. In other words, to sort of settle down into the target density and, and stick with that density. So these three diagnostics are, are ways of ensuring or ways of assessing whether you've uh, run enough uh, Markov chains. So uh, the first one I'm going to start with is the Gawicki diagnostic. Um, this diagnostic, as Jackman explains, is um, what amounts to is a, a, a t-test, or in this case a z-test, for um, whether uh, posterior estimates are different for the first 10% of your sample versus the first 50% of your sample. And if your Markov chain, uh, and this discards the burn-in, um, if your Markov chain is, is doing well, um, it should be the case that there should be no difference between your first 10% uh, of your sample and your first 50% of your sample. I'm sorry, it's the, I'm sorry, I take that back. It's the first 10% of your sample and the last 50% of your sample. So it's the front, the very front end, and then the back end of your estimates. I, I apologize. Um, so these are all Z statistics here, and if you uh, actually run the uh, Gawicki Diag help, uh, you'll see that the Z scores are um, reported here for each one of your parameters, alpha, beta, tau, y, and, and deviance. Um, and what you want out of this is for all these Z scores to be statistically insignificant, such as to say less than, let's say, 1.645, which is the 10% significance uh, threshold. Um, the, yeah, so the Z, Z scores are for a test of equality of means, uh, if you get a statistically significant test, that means the means are not equal. So, uh, in other words, if I'm estimating the mean alpha um, posterior, out of my posterior beliefs about alpha, that mean should be the same for the first 10% of my chain versus the last 50%. If you get a statistically significant z-score above 1.645, uh, what this is telling you is you need to run a longer chain. You need to run um, maybe more chains, but really you need to run longer chains. I've got a 5,000 length chain that's, that's more than sufficient is what this GUIKI diagnostic is telling me. Uh, the next convergence test is the Heidelberger diagnostic, uh, and you can see I'm going to run that right here. Uh, the Heidelberger di diagnostic runs uh, separately uh, for each uh, chain. You can see I've got four chains and I've got four tests here. And there are actually two tests here. Uh, one's the stationarity test and uh, one is the half-width test. Um, the stationarity test is exactly what it sounds like. It's a test of whether this chain for this for each parameter has reached a point where um, uh, the Kramer von Mies statistic cannot reject the null hypothesis that the distribution of the MCMC chain is stationary. Um, and usually you can specify any number of p values here, but um, in this case the default is uh, 5%. If uh, the null is that the distribution is stationary, if we receive a p-value on this particular statistic less than 0.05, we reject the null that it's stationary and conclude that it's not stationary. Uh, if we reject the null, that's very bad news because we want our, M our Markov chains to be stationary distributions because only then can we have any faith that they um, are stationary distributions, their stationary distributions match the target density because ultimately what we want them to do is to match the target density. Uh, now you can see these p-values are all pretty big except for the density on tau y. Uh, but the, for that chain, it's pretty. Uh, there's a pretty low p-value. But for all other three chains, the p-values are very high. So I, I would conclude that probably this is just a, a fluke. Um, and in fact, that all the chains really have reached stationary densities, hopefully stationary densities uh, of the target. Uh, the second test here is the half-width test. 
Uh, the half width test is basically a test of um, whether the uh, estimate of the mean of the posterior is uh, sufficiently accurate and more, more to the point is uh, sufficiently uh, low noise. Um, and so what you can see here uh, in the help file for the Heidelberger test is uh, that the half width test compares uh, the 95% confidence interval for the mean um, with uh, the estimate of the mean. And if the ratio between half the confidence interval and the mean is lower than some predefined threshold EPS, uh, the half width test is passed. Intuitively what this is doing is saying, I want to make sure that my estimate of the mean is um, low variance. Um, has a fair has a has a, a low enough variance that we can conclude that this uh, procedure that we run is a good estimate of that mean. Uh, in this case, we've uh, passed all of these um, these tests. There's actually no um, test statistic reported here, but what we do is divide um, the uh, half width divided by the mean, and as long as that's sufficiently small, we say the test is passed, and the test actually reports whether it's passed or not. It's passed in all cases. Both the stationarity and half-width tests have been passed in all cases. So that's, that's good news. Uh, the last diagnostic is the Raftery diagnostic. Um, oh, and I may need to uh, specify this as MCMC here. Oh. Yep, there we go. Uh, so uh, again, this is conducted separately for all four chains. Um, and what the Raftery test is looking at is, in essence, uh, it tries to estimate how long of a chain we need to run in order to um, accurately uh, get an accurate um, estimate of the density for all of our parameters. And what it does to do that is it looks at the tails of, of those, um, of those, uh, of those um, estimated densities. And, and I'm reading uh, straight out of Jackman right now. Um, what it does is it, uh, let's see, blah, 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 assess the accuracy of the MCMC-based estimate of the 2.5 uh, percentile, the 2.5th quantile, uh, with a 95% bound on the estimate no greater than 0.005 in quantile terms. So what it's in essence doing is saying, um, have I got a very narrow var uh, variance in estimates for the very edges of my density? If I do, if I'm estimating the edges uh, well in terms of at least having a low variance estimate, uh, I'm probably in good shape in terms of my uh, estimator. Um, but it goes further and says, well, we can use, um, we can use this uh, procedure to estimate how long of a sample we would need in order to get an accurate estimate. And in this case, uh, what it's telling us is uh, we need um, 3,787 uh, we need a sample size of, th or a chain length rather, of 3,787 in order to, um, to get uh, a, good, a good estimate. Now our chain is currently 5,000, so we're already in good shape. I can only see one of all these tests, uh, maybe one and a half if you count this deviance, uh, that's uh, actually telling us that um, we need to run a longer chain than we already have. So in general, the Raftery diagnostic here is telling us we're in good shape. Uh, you can get more um, estimates, or I'm sorry, more information rather, on the Raftery diagnostic and all these diagnostics by just calling up the uh, the health parameter. I'm sorry, <laughs> health parameter, the the help function, uh, and it uh, the most important thing is it tells you what you can actually uh, do uh, do with what it outputs. Um, so, for example, uh, let's see. Right. So it's uh, going to shoot out uh, a 3D array containing results. Yeah, M is the length of burn in, N is the uh, required sample size. Uh, and min is the minimum sample size based on zero autocorrelation. Uh, so this uh, total here is probably the uh, safest um, bet in terms of the Raftery diagnostic of how long you should make your chain in order to get quality estimates of the entire density. In this case, it's telling us we're in pretty good shape, so we don't have to think about it anymore. Uh, so you might want to use these diagnostic criteria when you're uh, using open bugs or wind bugs. Uh, to get a sense of whether your chains have converged properly. There's the MCMC plot command, and that gives you some information. But these diagnostics can, uh, can help you too. And in the case of the Raftery diagnostic, you can even get some direct information about uh, whether you, uh, how much longer you should make your chain if you need to make it longer. Uh, so I think uh, wind bugs and open bugs and also JAGs, which is a, a, ver a variant of um, uh, uh, just an, well, it's actually, <laughs> the acronym is just another Gibbs sampler. So it's, it's just another Gibbs sampler. 
Uh, it, it happens to work on Macintoshes, which is why it's gotten its popularity. Uh, those, those three are probably the most uh, common ways to, to estimate a, a, a model uh, with Bayesian techniques using a Gibbs sampler. Um, but if you don't like uh, creating a separate model uh, .bug file, uh, you can also, uh, there are some packages to run Bayesian uh, updating directly in R. And in particular, I want to show you a package called MCMC Pack. Uh, it was written, uh, there were multiple contributors, uh, Martin and Quinn were the primary contributors, and I think Dan Pemstein committed, uh, or, um, uh, contributed some uh, C programming to make the routines faster. MCMC Pack uh, can, um, com can do some, some work for you, uh, and in particular, uh, for simple models, it has some of these models actually built into itself. So for example, regression is a model that uh, MCMC Pack knows how to do automatically without programming any model at all. You just feed it, uh, and I can show you if you do MCMC regress, um, you just feed it a formula, uh, the data that you're using, tell it the burn-in um, length that you want. In this case, I've specified 1,000. Uh, how many MCMC updates you want to run? Oh, actually, I'm only going to run 5,000, I think. Uh, the thinning parameter, if you want to thin it all, whether it should spit out a bunch of uh, garbage, if you want to um, set the seed to a particular value, so you always get the same answer. In fact, I think I'm going to set the seed to a particular value. Um, uh, beta start, I believe, is the uh, yeah starting values for the beta vector. Um, if you um, specify nothing, it just runs a simple regression and uses those as the starting values, and I think that's perfectly reasonable. And then uh, little b0 and capital B0 are the... Uh, conjugate prior um, belief uh, parameters for, in this case, first the uh, constant and the uh, pro uh, coefficient on x, and then the um, covariance matrix, the VCV matrix for B0. Um, if you remember our, um, our uh, uh, discussion from last week, little b0 and capital B0 um, fit into a regression as conjugate priors when they um, specify a normal density for the um, prior beliefs about uh, our beta parameters. So in this case, uh, the um, um, MCMC package is allowing us to use um, ideas that we developed um, from closed form analytical versions of the regression, of, of Bayesian regression, but not have to think about all those formulas that we otherwise have to memorize. It'll sort of do that for you. Um, C0 and D0 are um, the shape parameter um, and the scale parameter um, for the degree of um, noise in the DGP, the variance of the DGP. Um, and these are um, gamma, not inverse gamma, um, parameters. So, uh, so in this case, I've, um, I've actually specified shape and scale uh, pretty, pretty small. Um, in, actually, I... Uh, no, actually, it says it's an inverse gamma here in the health file, so I should actually change this. This, are not, this is not about tau. This is about sigma squared. So I should probably actually change this to be a little different. Uh, I might want to set the, uh, I'm gonna set the shape to be equal to 1 and the scale to be equal to 2, maybe 3, which is a fairly diffuse prior. Um, so if I run uh, this chain, it's going to very quickly um, update it. It's much faster, um, at least for some models, um, than uh, the wind bugs and jags. And now uh, I can work with this regression.sim object. For example, I can plot regression.sim and it'll show me, let me expand this up for you here. Uh, these are um, plots of each of the um, main parameters I'm estimating, the intercept, uh, the beta on x, and uh, sigma squared. And these are densities, um, posterior densities uh, for each of those parameters. As you can see, um, my posterior density for the constant is about two and a half, um, a little less than three. Um, for the uh, regression coefficient, it's about mm, two and change, maybe three. It's supposed to be two, but we're still well inside the confidence intervals here. Uh, and our sigma squared is uh, centered on four, which is actually um, a bit bigger than it should be. I believe the, um, uh, the, the density is of two. Um, if I do a summary of regression.sim, uh, you can see it, it reports uh, some results uh, for each of my um, estimates. In other words, it just basically creates a regression table out of the results for you. Um, the mean estimate for the, um, the mean posterior, the mean of the posterior density for the x coefficient is 2.8. Uh, the true value is uh, 2, so it's, it's overshooting it by a bit. Um, sigma squared, the, it's uh, 
telling me the posterior, um, the mean posterior is 4.2, which is a bit bigger than it really ought to be. It may have something to do with the prior I specified. Um, in fact, let's see what happens if I uh, set this shape a bit lower. Five and scale of two. It doesn't really change that much. Now what happens if I set it to 0 0.001 and 0 0.001? And that's actually... Oh, no, that's not right. It's, it's, it's pretty much getting the same thing every time. So the priors doesn't seem to be informing it that much. No, the sigma estimate's not, not as good as it perhaps could be. Um, Anyway, it's the same, uh, the fundamentally the same um, way of doing the of, uh, of running these models, but uh, you're just uh, using a, a, a Markov chain Monte Carlo routine that's built into R. Doesn't require you to call open bugs um, or win bugs uh, separately. Um, so that's how to run a regression using Bayesian techniques in R. Now let's move on to uh, some more complicated models, and we'll start with the only slightly more complicated model, uh, the logistic model. All right, so uh, the first thing I'm going to do in, to run a logistic model is uh, create a fake data set. Uh, and what I'm doing is just uh, drawing, um, uh, again, a data set of size 50. Uh, X is out of the uniform between 0 and 1. Uh, and uh, the uh, latent index uh, X beta is going to be negative 2 plus 2X. Uh, and then I'm going to sample um, uh, from uh, the... Um, I'm going to sample random numbers out of the logistic distribution using uh, rlogis. Um, which uh, is going to give me y here. Uh, so if I uh, plot y against x, uh, there you go. I'm getting um, a logistically distributed variable uh, y here. And then what I need to do is, um, this is actually, I really ought to call this y star because this is the latent, excuse me, the latent index for y. Uh, then what I want to do is um, create the y variable, um, which is going to be um, uh, if y is, actually I should do it this way, y star bigger than 0. And I'm going to do this as numeric to turn it into a 1, 0 variable here. Oh, I could actually call that y star. So now if I do a plot of y against x, I'm getting a nice logistic model exactly the way I would um, or would anticipate. Um, the logistic function, the R logist, gives me um, values of the um, latent index y star, which is going to give me a, it's x beta plus a logistically distributed error um, with, in this case, scale 1. Um, normally, the scale uh, parameter in a logit model is unidentified because it's indistinguishable from x beta. So I'm setting an equal to 1 here in the same way that a maximum likelihood routine would. So now I'm going to load that into a, a data frame called dat and proceed with my analysis. Uh, so just like before, I'm going to um, run a, an open bugs, um, or actually I'm going, to, I'm going to do a win bugs model. Yeah, I see I'm specifying win bugs here. But I've got to change my model. Uh, so example 2.bug is a, a, a new... Um, a new model that uh, is specific to the logistic. Uh, so let's open up example2.bug and get a sense of what's going on in there. Okay, so here's our basic uh, logit model. And as you can see, uh, what we've done here is just adapted the regression example, um, but changed a few things to uh, make it a logit. So for example, um, y is no longer distributed uh, normally, as it was before, but it's distributed Bernoulli. Um, it's a series of Bernoulli trials with probability p, uh, pi, uh, 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 which is to say that the probability is specific to each observation i. Um, and uh, that probability pi, the, the logit transformation of that probability pi, uh, is given by uh, alpha plus beta times xi. Um, this logit transformation uh, makes it easy uh, for us to uh, run a model in WinBugs because it means that we don't have, we can just write the, um, it, in, other, in, in, in essence, uh, this is the link that transforms um, probability into uh, index space, and then we can just write the index as a linear model like so. Uh, I'm going to leave alpha and beta parameters as uh, reasonably um, diffuse, uh, just like I did before. Um, so this is a reasonably uninformative prior. 
Uh, now I can go back to R and I can uh, run this model on the data that I've created. So um, let's create this data set again. And uh, what you can see is I'm just gonna um, basically do the same thing I did before, almost exactly the same code. The only thing I'm really changing uh, is I'm running example2.bug instead of example1.bug. And it takes a second and it finishes up. Uh, let's uh, quickly check our diagnostics. Um, and it looks like our z-statistics are all pretty small, so we're good to go there. Uh, the Heidelberger diagnostics, uh, they're all listed as passing, so that's good news. Uh, the raft read diagnostics, that's telling us, oh, whoa, oh, saying some of these chains we really ought to have a sample size of oh, as many as 20,000 perhaps. So maybe we should go ahead and uh, rerun this chain with a somewhat longer, we'll say 25,000 chain. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so I'm going to rerun this again, and then compute the raft diagnostic again. Now, one thing you'll notice is this is taking uh, very. This is a very short time to run, um, only a few few seconds, really. Uh, that's partially because the data set in this particular example is so small; it's only size 50. Um, if we had a data set of 5,000 or 500,000, um, or even just 500. This would take a lot longer to do um, because you'd have to compute the likelihood for um, each one of those observations, just like we did in our build your own uh, Gibbs and Metropolis Hastings samplers last week. Um, so this can take a long time on a big data set, um, and it's not a trivial thing to just run 25,000 more uh, samples like I just did. Um, but in this case, it's something we can do, so why not? And it looks like in this case, we're getting uh, now sample sizes that are right around the sample size that we've actually run. So that's pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and call that a win. Uh, now let's uh, print the output and see what we've got here. Uh, well, it looks like uh, it's telling us that alpha is uh, somewhere between, let's see, uh, negative 6 and negative 1.8. And the answer is negative 2. So we're actually getting inside the 95% confidence interval there. Uh, beta is between 1.5 and 5.5. Um, it's 2. So that's good. Um, and if we do an MCMC plot of this, there we go. It's taking a second. It's taking a little bit longer because the, there's so many samples in this particular chain. Yeah, there we go. Uh, light coefficients are, are kind of crappy. Might We might go back in and thin those if you like. Um, but you can see here's our distributions for alpha and beta. The true value is negative 2 and 2, and we're well within those. Um, the estimates are somewhat high variance because this is uh, such a small sample, but nevertheless, it's coming out okay. Uh, I'm going to get rid of these plots here. So if we can attach uh, bugs, logit.sim, and maybe do a plot of the density for alpha. Um, oh, left out the A. There we go. Uh, this is exactly the same plot we were just looking at uh, in the MCMC uh, output. So I'm going to detach that. And that's it. That's all there is uh, to uh, conducting a logit analysis. Uh, now let's get into some uh, more complicated examples. So uh, the next example I'm going to do is a sample uh, with a unit heterogeneity, regression with unit heterogeneity. Um, and you might remember that um, uh, in, a, in a frequentist framework, when you're running Stata or even constructing these models in R, uh, you might run a random effects model, maybe a fixed effects model, but a random effects model on, um, on your data if you suspected that there was unit heterogeneity um, that was inflating or deflating uh, your variance, especially if it was deflating your variance statistics. Um, well, uh, we can do that in, in a Bayesian framework too. How do we do that? Well, let's find out. So uh, one of the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a data set that has unit heterogeneity in it. And uh, what you can see I'm doing here is I've constructed three variables, a unit, which is the unit you're in, uh, x and y. And uh, from i 1 to 20, which is going to be the unit, uh, I'm going to um, basically set your unit number equal to i. Uh, and I'm going to draw a unit effect out of the random uh, normal distribution uh, with a mean zero and standard deviation of three. So this is going to be a random effects DGP that I'm creating. Uh, and then I'm going to construct y as three plus two x uh, plus a normally distributed error um, plus whatever the unit effect I drew was. So every, um, every observation inside of a unit is going to have a common shock uh, to uh, its y. 
And uh, that common chalk, if you ignore it, is going to um, get its way into the, uh, the error term of your regression. So in other words, this is just going to necessitate us running a random effects model. So if I just run this whole thing, I get a data set with unit effects. Uh, and if I uh, look at that here, you can see I've got three variables, y, x, and uh, the unit identifier, which is just a number from 1 to 20. Uh, what I'm going to do uh, now in, um, in WinBugs is I'm going to specify a random effects model. And uh, I'm going to open up uh, example.3 here. This is a, a random effects model. It's just a regular regression model, but I've added in uh, this <coughs> random effects term. Uh, I'm adding it right onto the, the mu, um, which is the mean of, uh, of y. And uh, the random effects term is going to be a vector of length 20. And the particular value um, that any particular unit has is going to be a function of what unit identifier it has. So you, my unit value i, which is going to be a number of 1 to 20, determines what random effect I'm going to draw. Uh, and basically, I just have to add another loop where from j in 1 to 20, I uh, draw each unit effect um, out of the normal distribution with some kind of um, precision parameter corresponding to how spread out these um, random effects are. So all I've done is just added a couple of uh, additional parameters to my model, the random effects parameter, which is in turn a function of who, what unit you are and, uh, and how disperse um, the, this, particular random, uh, this particular random effect is. Uh, so uh, this is just a standard regression with a little bit of extra stuff, um, a, a common shock to a unit. Um, I'm telling um, uh, WinBugs to, um, to pick which random effect you get by your unit identifier, unit i, and then I just uh, tell it to update um, each unit's random effect uh, by drawing out of the normal distribution uh, with common, with uh, mean zero and, and uh, common um, variance uh, tau uh, re. And I'm drawing tau re from a very diffuse gamma distribution, assuming I don't know much about the distribution of unit effects in this particular data set. So now all I have to do is create an additional um, a variable called m. m is the length of, uh, how, or basically how many units there are. And I have to tell um, Widbugs that, so I'm going to tell it uh, m, this is the number of units. I'm going to feed it the unit variable y and x and then n, which is the total number of observations in the data set. And I'm going to set initial values for alpha, beta, tau y, tau re, and also the random effects uh, variable here. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm just initializing uh, the random effect at 0 for all 20. So this is rep 0, 20. If I run that, you'll see it just gives me a vector of 20 zeros. I'm initializing the random effect at nothing for everybody. So that's it. Just feed all that into uh, WinBugs. And, oh, I'm actually running this in OpenBugs, uh, just for some variety's sake. It's all the same anyway. It'll take a second to update. Yep, and there we go. It's all saved. Uh, so let's take a look at the, the wiki diagnostic. Mm, looks like they're all statistically insignificant, so that's a good thing. I need to call this as MCMC, so I'm going to check out my Heidelberg diagnostics here. Heidelberger diagnostics, rather. Uh, and they say pass. Now, I think I only ran one chain. Yes, that's true. I only ran one chain in this case, which is uh, why we're only getting one... Um, output here. And check out my Raftery Diagnostics. Whoa! It's saying that for alpha, I'm going to need uh, 80,000 samples. <laughs> that seems like kind of a lot. Um, but okay, so maybe what we'll do, since I have a 12-core computer, is just up the number of chains to 8. Um, that's going to actually give me pretty much the same results in, the, in almost the same time. Uh, so it's going to initialize eight chains, it's going to do some stuff, do a thing, uh, blah, blah, blah. Come on, computer, you can do it. Yeah, all right, pause the video, this is boring. All right, that's done. Uh, so uh, what are the raft rate diagnostics telling us now? Well, 90,000, 90,000, 91,000, 74,000, 78,000. Yeah, we need a really big chain. Um, all of the uh, half width tests and stationarity tests are passed uh, with, looks like, one exception. Um, 
So even though the Raftery diagnostic is telling us we need a few more, um, given the length of time it took to get uh, this particular sample, and also given the fact that the Raftery test is uh, reasonably conservative, I'm going to go ahead and say this is fine. Uh, so now what I want to do is uh, do an MCMC plot of uh, RE sim. And it'll take a second to load up. Looks like it's all done. Uh, here we go. So uh, here's my diagnostic plot for... Uh, wait a minute, there should be more here. That's for logit.sim. Uh, oh. I know what I forgot to do. I forgot to specify the directory. So I need to go up there and say I want the directory to be the current working directory. Where are we? Ah, there we are. Try that again. There we go. Bam. So, uh, yeah, it looks like there's quite a bit of uh, correlation in alpha, which um, would be problematic. And also, it looks like the mixing is not going uh, as well as it could um, for alpha, um, which is probably why the Raptory diagnostic is telling us that we need such huge, um, uh, such a huge number of draws from the chain. Uh, on the good side, uh, beta is looking pretty solid, um, decent uh, lag characteristics and good mixing. Uh, so is tau. Uh, here's uh, tau y, and this is the tau re, which is the degree of um, precision in the random effects, uh, uh, the the number of random of, or the uh, distribution of random effects. Um, the alpha plot is a little troubling. I probably, in this case, uh, would think about thinning that chain a little bit, um, given its extremely high level of correlation and the fact that the mixing doesn't seem to be going very well. So the fact that the mixing on that alpha parameter is so bad might lead us to think about, well, is there something screwed up about this model? Now, the, the model we, as we've written it is actually, technically speaking, correct. Um, it's, it's, uh, you might think, well, there might be an identification problem because we're uh, estimating um, a whole bunch of different um, uh, random effects uh, for each unit and um, thus we're eliminating the, um, the, the constant. In other words, we sort of set ourselves into a dummy variable trap. Uh, but that's not exactly true because this random effect uh, is distributed, it's, it's constricted to be um, distributed around zero. And so alpha should be the uh, portion of the uh, constant variance that's not explainable by these deviations around the constant. Uh, but on the other hand, um, we're still separately estimating the D norm around zero and alpha. So maybe it would be better, maybe convergence would improve if we uh, made alpha a part of the normal uh, distribution. In other words, we said alpha is the uh, center of the random effects distribution. It's the same thing, so still just estimating a constant. But now in this mu, uh, in this mu expression, we don't have alpha entering uh, separately. We have it entering as a part of the random effects parameter. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is just a rerun um, the uh, chains that I already had. Let me just clear this out here. I'm just going to rerun everything um, with um, this new version of the program. And actually, I'm going to turn down the number of chains back to one. Because as you're going to see, that's going to fix this convergence problem very nicely. So I'm just going to make sure I've got all new data and everything. So I'm just going to load the chain. It's just going to take a second for this to run. And it's already done. And you can see already uh, things are better because the Raftery diagnostic for this chain is telling us that 3,000 is uh, perfectly fine. Um, that's, a, that's an indicator that things have gotten markedly better. And if we go to the MCMC output here, uh, wow, this looks much, much better. Um, we've got our alpha centered on. Um, uh, it, it's mixing correctly. Uh, there's no uh, problem in the autocorrelation. Uh, uh, the constant is 3, so it should be centered on 3. And uh, you can see it's not quite centered on three, um, but this is a fairly small sample. So um, uh, it's actually three, I think, is still in the 95% credible region. Uh, we could figure that out by looking at uh, print um, re sim. And in fact, yes, three is inside the, uh, uh, seven, or no, three is just outside the 95% credible region. 
Um, so it's uh, this, may, this may be a case where we got slightly unlucky, but you're talking about um, only 20 observations of units and 50 observations per unit. Um, so a relatively uh, small panel, um, which might be responsible for the relatively crappy estimates um, of the alpha parameter. Um, in terms of uh, the beta, um, we're doing, uh, looks like a little better here. It's centered on two, which is what it should be. Correlations look fine, mixing looks fine. Uh, tau RE, which is our distribution of the, um, how much precision is there in the distribution of random effects, looks like it's centered on uh, 0.15. Um, and correlation looks good. So um, much better performance out of our model with a relatively um, small change um, in, in the, how the program was written. So something to think about if you ever see convergence problems. Uh, don't necessarily just attack them with uh, more iterations or more chains. Think about maybe improving your program. Uh, let's take a look at the plot. This is the plot of uh, square root of 1 over tau re. So this is the square root. This is the uh, sigma of the distribution um, for random effects. And what this is telling us is the random effects are distributed around a mean of, well, zero if we're thinking, considering them random effects or the, of the constant if you want to sort of add that in. Uh, and the variance, or I'm sorry, the standard deviation of the of the random effects is somewhere between two and three. Um, so we're, and in fact, uh, it, we specified it to be, I think, three? Two. No, uh, no, unit effects are, are three. So it's well inside uh, what we would expect. Uh, so random effects models uh, work well in, uh, in, in uh, Bayesian framework. And in fact, uh, mathematically speaking, they're uh, even easier to think about in the Bayesian framework than they are um, in the frequentist framework or, or the maximum likelihood framework. Um, in the maximum likelihood framework, uh, computing a random effects model is, is somewhat complicated because you have to integrate out the random effects as a part of the likelihood maximization process. In R, it's just a matter of uh, adding another parameter, adding a random effects parameter and, and estimating those things on the fly. A relatively easy and straightforward thing to do. So it makes random effects a very natural um, way to proceed uh, when you're thinking about uh, a Bayesian analysis in the panel uh, framework. So the last thing I want to show you today um, is a, a function of the um, MCMC pack package or library that I showed you earlier. Um, MCMC pack has a nice little function called MCMC Metrop 1R. Uh, MCMC Metrop 1R allows you to um, sample uh, using a Metropolis Hastings algorithm from any arbitrary um, uh, uh, po posterior function that you yourself can specify. And so what I want to do here is uh, set up a little problem where I generate some data out of the Calgy distribution and then use MCMC Metrop 1R to recover the location and scale parameters uh, which are unknown. So uh, what I'm doing is I'm saying that uh, x is, a, I'm going to draw a data set of size 50 and uh, uh, that's x, uh, that's the predictor, and y is a dependent variable and it's just going to be distributed Calgy uh, with location or mean, uh, not actually not not mean, it's location. Whoops. Uh, 2x plus 1 and a scale of uh, 0.5. Uh, and then I'm going to just load that into a data frame called dat. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I want to estimate uh, a Cauchy distribution, this Cauchy distributed model. It's uh, sort of like a regression, except instead of assuming that the regression errors are normally distributed, I'm going to assume that they're Cauchy distributed. So uh, in a Bayesian analysis, I need to specify the likelihood in the prior and then combine those in the posterior and, and sample out of the posterior. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, first write a likelihood function using the Cauchy uh, function. So what this Cauchy.like function does is it takes three arguments, uh, the beta parameter, uh, y and x, so in other words, the beta and the data. <laughs> and uh, the first... Um, uh, 1 minus length b minus 1 elements are uh, going to be the beta parameters on x. Uh, and the very last element of that b vector or beta vector is going to be um, gamma, the estimated um, uh, uh, scale of the, of the Cauchy distribution. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to calculate the, uh, the Cauchy density for every um, observation in x. So I'm going to get a vector of these. Uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, uh, take the, I'm going to compute the log likelihood. This is a log likelihood problem. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, uh, basically pick the maximum of out, which is the likelihood, and uh, a very, very small number. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because if out is very close to zero or even zero, 
the log of zero is uh, negative infinity, and I don't want infinities creeping into my likelihood. So I'm basically going to um, force the likelihood to be at the least a very, very small number before I take the log. Uh, then what I'm going to do is just log uh, those, all those likelihoods and then add them up. So as you may recall from um, your like maximum likelihood class, uh, if you're dealing with raw likelihoods, you, you uh, multiply them to create the joint likelihood of the data. If you're, taking, if you're assuming log likelihoods, you sum them, which is a property of, of, of logs. The uh, log of a product is the sum of the logs. So there's my likelihood function. Uh, my prior uh, is just, um, well, I've got three parameters in this case, so I've written a custom prior. Uh, the first one is the, uh, is the uh, prior on the constant. Um, the second is the prior on x. So in other words, uh, going back to our location, we've got 2x plus 1 here. Um, we need a prior for the constant and a prior for the coefficient on x. And I'm just specifying normal priors with mean of 0 and standard deviation of 3. So reasonably diffuse priors. For the third uh, gamma parameter, I'm saying that as long as gamma is bigger than 0, um, the, uh, uh, the prior will be given by an inverse gamma with shape 0 0.001 and scale 5. So this is a reasonably um, diffuse prior. And you can see what that prior looks like. I could uh, create an x for a sequence uh, from is 0.01, 2 is, uh, say, 5, uh, by is uh, 0.01, uh, and then y is uh, the inverse gamma of x. And then, oh, oh I've got to load the pack library. There we go. And plot uh, y given x. And there we go. That's what our prior looks like. Um, I'm actually not super enthused about that. I might turn down the scale just a little bit. Three here. Let's see what three looks like. Yeah, it's moving a little closer to zero, which I like better. So I'm going to set that at three. Uh, now again, I've got to take the maximum of whatever prior I come up with and a very small number because I need to log these priors um, and uh, and then add them together. And I can't add a log of zero because the log of zero is negative infinity. So there's my prior. Now uh, my posterior is usually my likelihood times my prior. But I've got log likelihood and a log prior. So if I'm multiplying two log numbers, uh, what I want to do, if I, I'm sorry, if I'm multiplying two numbers and then take the log of that, uh, what I'm doing is adding the sum, um, it's the sum of their logs. Uh, so instead of uh, multiplying these together, I'm adding them uh, together. And actually, I'm going to add a return out statement just to make that uh, syntactically unambiguous. R would actually do the right thing there, but I want to make sure that R does the right thing. So I'm going to load that posterior up. And now I'm ready to simulate. So MCMC Metrop 1R, MCMC Metrop 1R, uh, samples from a user written R function, which in this case, the fun is the first argument. Uh, the function is Cauchy posterior. Uh, what I need to give it is some initial values uh, for, th for the vector of things it's sampling out of, and I'm just feeding it a vector of ones. Uh, I need to tell it uh, uh, any arguments the, that the posterior function takes, in this case y next, I've got to tell it what t those are, uh, and y is going to be just y, the data that's already in memory right here. Uh, x is going to be um, uh, x, but it's also going to be a column of ones. So I'm C binding together um, 1 and x because I'm estimating two things. I'm estimating a coefficient on the constant and a coefficient on x. So I, I, need, I need those two things to be bound together, and in fact, I'm going to do that. Oh, it looks like I get to load x again because uh, I put in an x before. So let's do that again. Uh, now, so c bind 1 and x. Yep, that looks right. Uh, so, okay, so uh, that's perfectly reasonable. Just remember to add in the constant whenever you're doing in these uh, user-specified functions. I'm going to set a burn-in of 500. Uh, you can play around with that if you like, and I'm going to take uh, 20,000 draws. So uh, MCMC Metrop 1R is a reasonably uh, fast uh, um, algorithm because it's written in C or C++, whatever. Um, and uh, it's done. It's stored the results in Calci.sim, and it tells me that the Metropolis acceptance rate was uh, about 50%. Um, you want a Metropolis uh, acceptance rate typically between 40 and 60%, so that's uh, good news. Uh, so now if I do a plot of Calci.sim... It's going to tell me uh, the trace of my chains and also the density that I uh, got out of those chains. 
Uh, the traces look pretty good. Looks like we're getting pretty decent mixing. Uh, and uh, looks like, mm, let's see, this is variable one. This is the constant. This is uh, x. And then I think this third thing is the, yeah, that's the shape co or the scale coefficient. Uh, so if we go back to our um, initial thing here, we're looking for a constant of about one. That looks pretty good. Uh, we're looking for a multiply, uh, I'm sorry, a, a coefficient on x of about two. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Not exactly the posterior mode, but close. And we're looking for a scale of about a half, and our scale is about a half. So our model is accurately recovering uh, the things that, that we wanted it to recover. Uh, and I can print out a sort of pseudo regression uh, table here for my couch it. Or that's, this is not a couch, this is a couchy uh, continuous model. Uh, here's the mean of the posterior distribution, 1.15. It should be 1, so that's good. Uh, this uh, is the mean of the posterior mode for uh, the coefficient on x, which should be 2, and it's about 2. That's good. Um, and here's uh, for the shape parameter. So this is a really powerful... Um, MCMC Metrop 1R is a very powerful uh, tool because it allows you to write whatever posterior function that you can imagine, and as long as it's a reasonable posterior, in other words, as long as it's... Um, it is a proper posterior, uh, you'll get interesting answers. You can estimate coefficients um, out of that model. It doesn't have to be pre-programmed at all, and you don't have to write your own Gibbs sampler or Metropolis Hastings sampler in order to do that. Um, I can specify any likelihood that I like. Uh, if I recall correctly, I, I'm pretty sure that I used MCMC Metrop 1R in, um, in, in, some, in some versions of my um, political analysis piece with Will Moore and Buma Mukherjee, I think for reasons of time, we ended up um, just approximating the posterior mode with a maximum likelihood model because we had to run many, many, many thousands of iterations and every iteration if we had to run Bayesian chains would just would have taken forever. So we ended up um, shortcutting using uh, maximum likelihood methods. But our original, my original forays um, used the MCMC Metrop 1R package when I was exploring um, how, the, how my likelihood for that particular model worked. Um, and it was really, really helpful. It's really helpful for models where there's, there exists uh, no closed package, not even a bunch of distributions to, um, to enable you to sample out of it. MCMC Metrop 1R can sort of take care of the details of Metropolis Hastings samples for you as long as you can write down the posterior. If you can write down the posterior, uh, MCMC Metrop 1R can take care of quite a bit of the rest. All right, well, that's uh, probably enough for one week. Um, thanks for watching, and uh, next week we'll start to talk about uh, uh, some really deep applied stuff. Um, in particular, we're going to talk about um, hierarchical modeling using these packages that you've learned this week. So, I'll see you then.